Recording in progress. Okay. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Our analysis seminar. It's a pleasure to have Professor Diego Moreira from the Universidade Federal do Ceará in Brazil uh, visit us for what the second or third time? Second time. Okay. <laughs> He'll be talking today to us about up to the boundary gradient estimates in Bernoulli type free boundary problems. It's a pleasure to have you again here, Diego. May this continue your string of visits. <laughs> the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Emmanuel. So I'd like to thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's a nice opportunity to be here again and see all of you uh, from, from last year. Okay, so uh, what I plan to do today is to talk about this. This is a kind of a recent work that I did in collaboration with Ederson Braga. Ederson was my first PhD student in Brazil. And he is a professor at uh, Universidade Federal do Ceará, the university where I met. I met. So, uh, so let me give you a pretty quick, um, uh, let's see if this, with the mouse a little bit sometimes just to, or click on the PDF. Yeah. Okay, so here's a quick outline of the, most almost certainly, I don't have the time to go all the way to the end, so I will stop somewhere in between. But my goal is here are at least to to present you the the statements of the results and at least give you uh, some hints of why the, the result should be true and eventually uh, provide the, uh, some of the ingredients of the constructions of the the elements that I did for the proof. So the outline is the classical results in LEPD versus unbounded coefficients. So then I'll talk a little bit about gradient up to the boundary, the players and pearls. Then I'll, 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 I'll try to state the main result and then I will revisit at least the interior case so that to give you some feedback on what it is. And in fact, I, I will be finishing somewhere uh, talking about the barriers because I don't, I don't think that I will have time to talk about seven and eight, which is the strategy of the group for the boundary estimate and the trace estimate. So I'll, I'll start very, very uh, slowly. Um, so my, my perspective is the following. My understanding is that there, there has been an effort in the last 20 years for where many people are interested to to, to do an extension of the theory of the regularity theory of PDEs for PDEs that have bounded coefficients for the, the PD that have unbounded coefficients. When you do this change that you go from bounded coefficients to unbounded coefficients, eventually this is a delicate issue because some of the classical theorems, if you are not very careful on the regularity of the coefficient that you are putting in the equation, the classical results may fail. Right? So uh, let me show you a couple of them. So th the first example is due to Safano. There's a very nice and simple example in 2010. Consider this function, which is u of x one minus x squared, right? So you see that this function satisfies this very simple linear ellipse, Laplacian of u plus where this drift term, the drift coefficient is given by this vector field here and x over x squared. And you can see pretty clearly that the sub of u is not a thing on the boundary, right? Uh, and why this happens? Maximum principle fails. And the maximum principle fails. The reason is just because of the, the low regularity of the coefficient. The coefficient is in ln minus epsilon for every epsilon. So the coefficient is not in ln. So this b here is not in ln. That's why the maximum principle fails. Right? We know that if B is zero or if B is in an infinity, the, the, the theorem is true, right? But if B is, is slightly below LN, the theorem fails. This is not a property of the maximum principle. If you go to the Hopf, the Hopf principle also, the same thing happens. You see, hopefully, Nick and Lipsch is up to the boundary. So this also due to Safano, right? So you consider this, this cube, right? And in this paper, Safanov constructed two functions, right? Which are continuous up to the boundary. They vanish in one of the faces of the cube and they are solutions to this elite PD, again, the same ones as before, where the B now is in LN, right? So 
these are the, I am just summarizing the details of his construction. However, uh, the Hopf lemma fails, right? The infimum of U of U1 over Xn is zero. So the solution reaches the boundary of the cube in a tangential fashion. Not only that, the, the, the solution U2 is not continue, is not Lipschitz also. You see U2 over Xn goes to infinity as you approach the boundary. So the Hopf-Holenic lemma fails, the Lipschitz up to the boundary. This is the Hopf-Holenic lemma that fails, the Lipschitz up to the boundary fails, and the boundary Harnack also fails. Because the boundary harmonic, if the boundary harmonic were true, those two ingredients, those two quantities should be finite, and they are not. Right? So the re so why is why is this the case? So hopefully Nick Lemma. Sorry, what, what did I do? Try to go back here to see. Yeah, okay. Back to the thing. So uh, hopefully, Nick Lemma fails and Lipschitz regular both fails. Reason the B is in LN. Right? So, what is this? Uh, you define this Q plus half. What is this? Uh, X dash and this Q. Right. So, it, it, it's like it like it's something like that. That's just the first n minus one coordinate. Yeah, the, the, oh. the rest is n minus one coordinates here, and here is the XN. Oh. So, here is our n minus one. Yeah. This is the notation. Okay. okay, now just en passant, let me mention the Hopf boundary regularity. If you have, let's say, u of x to be this very simple function, f of f x times y in R2 in the first quadrant, right? So consider this function in the first quadrant here. This is my domain, right? x times y. So this is a harmonic polynomial, right? And the normal derivative vanishes at the origin, <laughs> right? So you have a positive harmonic function that vanishes on the boundary, but the normal derivatives there also vanish, and so they silent Hopf's lemma. And the reason is there is a corner on the boundary. Right? This is nothing to do with the coefficients, but I just want to emphasize that the fact that there is a corner here makes the Hopf's lemma uh, also fails. Okay, so let me summarize this. Uh, so let me go to the classic theory, and then I'll, I'll try to point out some of the difficulties. So uh, the, the, this theorem is going to be in the framework of PDEs. I want to transfer this to free bounded problems, but before I do it, I need to see what, are, what, is the, what is the danger when I walk into the road of trying to extend the theorems from PDEs to free boundaries. So the regular theory of PDE says the following. If you give me, if you give me you as a bounded solution, and some function in LQ where Q is bigger than N, and you consider this equation, Laplace of U equals to F in B1 plus. B1 plus for me is half a ball. Let me set this notation that I'm gonna be using for quite a while. So B1 plus is again like this. This is the XN again, right? Okay, so if I have Laplace of U equals to F, and I prescribe some C1 alpha boundary data here. I want to see what is the regularity of the solution. And we know from the boundary regularity of PDE that the solution is C1 alpha all the way up to the boundary. So if I go say to half a ball like this, the solution is C1 alpha all the way up to the boundary. Of course, of course, if the solution is C1 alpha all the way up to the boundary, right? The solution is also Lipschitz. Right? If the, if the C1, not only the solution is C1 alpha, but I have an estimate for the solution. The C1 alpha norm is bounded by a universal constant times the L infinity norm of U plus the LQ norm of the right hand side plus the C1 alpha uh, norm of the boundary data. Right? Of course, if I am C1 alpha, of course I am Lipschitz too. Uh, this is a triviality, it is, it is a triviality, but I am pointing this out because for free boundary problem, there is no hope that this estimate will be true, but this one survives. So I am emphasizing the Lipschitz regularity just because this is what the, the best regularity that I can hope for free boundary problems. Uh, this estimate also works for if I replace the Laplace of U, the, the Laplacian by some fully nonlinear, or for the Laplace, if I do a little correction on the right hand side. In fact, for the Laplace here, 
it appears a power here, one over P minus one. For the fully linear, the estimate is exactly that one, no change. Okay, so let me go back and say that if I have a, if I have the solution where uh, the, the, the coefficients, the coefficients of the equation are nice. So this, the operator is very nice. The right-hand side is in LQ with Q bigger than N, right? The boundary data is very nice because it's C1 alpha and the boundary is also nice because it's flat. So if everything is okay, equation is okay, coefficients are okay, boundary data is okay, boundary is okay, then the gradient survives and the solution goes C1 alpha all the way up to the boundary. This is not always the case. The existence of the gradient is very sensitive to this ingredient, the regularity of the coefficients, the regularity of the boundary data, and the regularity of the boundary. In other words, if any of those things goes bad, you may fail to have the gradient, the estimate of the gradient up to the boundary. Let's see some examples. So this is an example that I constructed with Lee Hwang a couple of years ago. So we constructed a function, Laplace of U equals to F, this is in R2. Laplace of U equals to F, U is continuous all the way up to the boundary, vanishes on the boundary, on the flat boundary, but this F is in L2. It's not in LQ for Q bigger than N, it's exactly where Q is N. So F is in L2, right? Then what happens? Then solution is not even leap sheets. In any tiny ball around the origin, let alone differentiable, let alone C1 alpha, right? In other words, if the coefficients is bad in the sense that the coefficients is ln, well, n, n match the dimension, the gradient may fail to exist around uh, in any point of the boundary. So the solution is not even Lipschitz and the, the, the normal derivative blows up as you approach the origin. So here we have the regularity of the boundary is okay because the boundary is flat, the regularity of the boundary data is also okay, boundary data is zero, right? But the regularity of the coefficient is bad because the coefficient is in Ln and this is enough to, 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 to break the existence of the gradient on the boundary. Okay, here is another simple, uh, in interesting example. Uh, I cannot press this thing twice, otherwise it goes out. But... So here is an example that you can take. This is an exercise from Evan's book, actually. So you take a harmonic function in the half space, continues all the way up to the boundary, but on the boundary, the function is this cone in the X prime variable, right? So there is a representation formula for that we're using the Poisson kernel, et cetera. If you do this computation, you can see that this, this, this first order differential quotient mimicking the, norm, the first derivative, the normal derivative, it blows up, right? So again, we have the regularity of the boundary is okay because the boundary is, a, is flat, is a plane, right? The regularity of the coefficients are spectacular because the function is harmonic, right? But the regularity of the boundary data is terrible. The boundary data is Lipschitz, right? There is a kink at the origin. And so the gradient uh, does not exist and the normal derivative blows up just because it is very sensitive to the singularity of the boundary data in the, on the, or in the origin. Finally, let's consider this, this example. Uh, so you have a harmonic, you have a, this is a sector, a circular sector where you take this alpha to be bigger than pi, right? Then you take a harmonic function, which, go, which is one around here and zero at the, the edges of this cone. And you make a smooth transition here, the way you like from one to zero, just to glue it in a continuous fashion, right? If this is in R2, you have a formula for that. This is like the imaginary or the real part of Z to the alpha, let's say, right? When they say the same way, when you do this computation here, the regularity of the boundary data is okay because the boundary data is zero in the neighborhood of this king. The regularity of the coefficient is also okay because the function is harmonic, right? But the regularity of the boundary is the, is the, is the villain here. Uh, the boundary has a kink and also the gradient uh, didn't exist there. So in other words, if I am in a PD, if I, am a if I want to study the regularity of a solution of a uniform PD all the way up to the boundary, I have to be careful with these three ingredients, the regularity of the boundary, the regularity of the boundary data, and the regularity of the coefficients. 
because if any of those guys goes bad, the, the gradient may fail to it. The gradient actually may blow up on, on the boundary. Okay, towards the main result. So this is uh, not to be afraid of this slide. Let me just put and explain simple words. What is that? Uh, so I will consider a fully nonlinear operator, right? Uh, and fully nonlinear, and I will consider the case where this fully nonlinear operator is uniformly elliptic. This means what? Uniform elliptic ellipticity just means that when you change the operator from NP to NQ, this difference is controlled above and below by the Pucci operators uh, with, some, with some degradient parts and here and eventually made the superlinear parts. So ellipticity, in general, ellipticity means, uh, elliptic equation means that this F is monotone in the matrix. Uniform ellipticity means that it's quantitatively monotone. Quantitatively monotone in the sense, in the sense that this difference is controlled above and below by the difference of the matrix and the difference of the gradients. This F, as I have seen by my previous examples, this F I will consider in LQ, where Q is bigger than N, because we know that if we are in LN, we have counterexample, right? And this drift also, this drift coefficient here, which is unbounded, I'm going to consider also bigger than N and bigger than Q. And the M are the Pucci extremal operators, which are the, 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 the two extremal operators that we use in the definition to define what that uniform electricity means. Okay, so let me just uh, give, give a, a quick uh, description of what is going on here. The origin of this theory goes back to Caffarelli, Crandall, Cochran, and Esfiek in, in in, for fully known equations with measurable ingredients, a famous paper in CPAM in 1996. The existence ABP, Harnack inequality with unbounded coefficients is also superlinear growth has been done for many people. Koi, Kisviek, Boyan Sirakov, Lihewan, Krilov, Safan, Abdon, many, 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 there are many very interesting results on, on the work of uh, equations with unbounded coefficients. And gradient estimates in theory on the boundary, there is a couple of people that have been working on that, and Gabriele Norberg, Isviek, myself, Lihe, Edison, uh, João Vitor, a bunch of other people, and the, this is a type of estimate that we are searching for. That the, 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 the C1 alpha norm of the solution all the way up to the boundary, the solution is not only C1 alpha, but it, the, we have an estimate where the right hand side, the, the C1 alpha norm is controlled again by the LFN norm of U, by the, the LQ norm of the right hand side and the C1 alpha of the boundary again. Okay, here is the goal now. The goal is the following. Instead of having a PDE, right? I don't have a PDE anymore. I have a function U, let's say, which is continuous. And the function is positive somewhere. So this is the positivity set of my function U. I have no clue about the geometry, the shape, whatever of the set. And I'm going to impose the same problem. So I have a solution of this PDE not in the entire bowl, but eventually just inside the set, which may be a priori a crazy set, right? I will prescribe a boundary data, right? U equals to phi here on the fixed boundary, right? And I'm gonna add this condition here. So the free boundary for me is exactly the interface that separates where U is positive from where U is negative. And on the free boundary here, right? I will have that the gradient only along the free boundary is bounded by some function C, let's say bounded function, right? The question is, can I recover, can I recover the same type of result that I have before where I have a, where I have a PD with, where there is no free boundary? How about if I replace the fully nonlinear one by a P Laplace? Can I say uh, the same thing? So that's the, that's the, the Okay, so let me. Okay, so let me go. So here, let me convince you uh, uh, using the classical theory of free boundary problems. So remember that what happens in the PDE when the PDE does not hold only in this set 
which may be crazy a priori, right? But it holds in the whole ball. And I have a sled, say a C1 alpha boundary data prescribed here. The solution is C1 alpha all the way up to the boundary. For free boundary problems, so this is now a free boundary problem where I have, I have a solution just holds here. I have a C1 alpha boundary data, and I know that the gradient is bounded just along the free boundary. So the, the goal is to propagate this boundedness of the gradient, not only on the free boundary, I want to propagate it inside. This is what I want to do. Uh, solutions for this problem can never be better than Lipschitz. Let me convince you of that. This is a classical free boundary problem. So let's say that you have a non-negative harmonic function uh, where <laughs> whenever is positive, and let's say that the gradient is one along the free boundary. How do I get a function satisfying these conditions? I just minimize this function, right? So the reasoning here is the following. If I don't have this part, so let me try to use this. If I don't have the characteristic part and my functional is just gradient of u, if I minimize, I become harmonic. But if I have this guy here, this guy is, so the guy is, is collecting the contribution of the positivity set. So in order to minimize this, there is a competition between these two terms. I may need to vanish somewhere in order to make the contribution of this, this term as little as possible. So my function is not negative, but since I'm compete, I am minimizing this competition, the function has to, to gloom on the bottom somewhere in order to try to minimize energy. So the function glooms here, let's say, let's say that I prescribe a boundary data here, you can, you can think as a wire, right? And then I am gonna minimize this function among all the functions that I have this wire prescribed on the boundary. So the solution glues somewhere in the bottom, Function is no negative, it goes somewhere here. You can easily prove, right, that whenever the function is positive in the positivity set, which is this set outside here, right, this term may become irrelevant because the function is already positive. So minimizing locally the function in the positivity set, it is as if this term has no contribution. So the function becomes harmonic. <laughs> Okay, suppose for a second, right, that the free boundary here, which is the boundary of the positivity set, becomes a smooth set. This, in fact, happens. We know that this free boundary is smooth, is analytic in dimensions two, three, and four. It is open for five and six, and we, we know that in f to dimension seven, the similar set may exist. But let's, let's, let's take in R2. In R2, this free boundary is smooth, then what do I have? I have a harmonic function that vanishes on the boundary of a C2 set. So Hopp lemma tells me that the gradient gets the transversal. If the gradient gets here transversal, right? So if I go, if I come from positive side, the gradient is transversal. If I come from the zero side, the gradient is zero. There is a jump on the gradient along the free boundary. So there is no chance for the, free, for, for the gradient to be C1 because it's discontinuous on the free boundary. So the best that I could hope for that solution is Lipschitz. So if I take minimize, in other words, if I take minimizer of this problem, this free boundary problem is the Euler-Lagrange equation of this functional. So if I am interested to prove the regularity of solutions for this equation, if I take this as an example, I know that I can never expect my solution to be above Lipschitz. Uh, okay, so then let me go back to the problem here. I'll put on the, the whole assumptions. I have a fully nonlinear PDE. The right hand side is in LQ, with Q is bigger than N. The drift term that measures the ellipticity of that is also in L, some LQ zero. I prescribed a C1 alpha boundary data. This huge condition here is just saying that F is elliptic. And I put some continuity on the coefficient, which is natural for this type of theory. Right, uh, we know from the Di Giorgi or Creo Safano that you get, if you get even linear equations with bounded measurable coefficients, solutions are only C alpha. Since I am interested in proving C1 alpha theory, I have to put some control of some sort on the coefficients. So I am asking the coefficients to be continuous, right? Then what happens? So here is a theorem, the theorem which is the substitute, right, of the theorem that I discussed. Above. So, uh, there is actually a picture of that which is better, but let, let me try to explain this. So, suppose my function is continuous, 
is a viscosity solution of a free boundary problem when the boundary data is C1 alpha. So let, let me go to the picture. I think this picture is, is better. Uh, to, it's better to see what is going on. Uh, so I have, I, I, this is my free boundary problem. I have this PDE inside the positivity set. I prescribed a C1 alpha boundary data down here. And I have also this free boundary condition. The question is, can I prove or not that the solution is Lipschitz all the way up to the boundary? Can I ever be better than Lipschitz? Lipschitz is the best that I could hope for. So my question is if I can prove that the solution is Lipschitz all the way up to the boundary. And then let me go back here to show you, yes, I can under two situations. First of all, Under this DPT condition, what is this DPT condition? DPT condition means that the function phi, which is C1 alpha, vanishes. A a anywhere where the function vanishes, the gradient also vanishes. So if I have this condition, right, which is very, uh, is very natural from the physics perspective, right? From the, from, uh, from the physics perspective, it's very natural. So I can prove the theorem under this condition. Let me explain why this is reasonable. Um, what does DPT stand for? The generate phase transition. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Uh, so let, let me let, let me convince you really easily that. Uh, so what I want to prove, I want to prove an estimate for u plus. I'm unable at this moment to prove, this is like a one phase problem. I'm unable to prove that the gradient is bounded if the solution change phases. So I, I just want, my theorem only works if I, I am bounding the gradient of the positive part. Okay, Let, forget the free boundary. Let's see what happens even for harmonic functions. Suppose that I have a C1 alpha boundary data here and I want to prove that the gradient of u plus is bounded somehow, <laughs> right? Then when I look at this, I look, look, I want to prove that the gradient of u plus is bounded. What is the boundary data of u plus? The boundary data of u plus is phi plus. But if phi is c1 alpha, phi plus destroys a priori the regularity of phi, right? So phi plus, so you are composing a c1 alpha function with a Lipschitz function which is the X plus. So phi plus is at most Lipschitz. So in this case, right? So I, I, I would have say a harmonic or a subharmonic function here, U plus, right? Where the boundary data is only Lipschitz. I have a subharmonic function where the boundary data is Lipschitz. We know from harmonic analysis, for instance, that Harmonic functions with Lipschitz boundary data are never Lipschitz. They are in the Zygmunt class at most. This is not true for C alpha. If I give a harmonic function with a C alpha boundary data for alpha between zero and one, the strict solution is C alpha all the way up to the boundary. But it fails when alpha is equal to one. So I need to, I need to, to resolve this issue, right? So because I have U plus and the boundary data is only Lipschitz, how do you avoid the boundary data to be Lipschitz? What I ask is that phi plus is also C1 alpha. Otherwise, there is no chance that I can prove the theorem because if the, if the boundary data is only Lipschitz, there is no, there is no chance that, that I'm going to prove that the gradient is bounded, right? And let me tell you, if phi is C1 alpha, phi plus, is C1 alpha if and only if the DPT holds. So DPT becomes a natural condition because of that, right? Okay, so then my, the theorem says the following. If, uh, uh, if, the DP, if the boundary data satisfies DPT, then my solution is Lipschitz, right? I have a bound for the gradient, the solution is Lipschitz. And what is the estimate? The estimate is exactly the estimate that I had before. In other words, the gradient is bounded by the LFE norm of U, plus the LQ norm on the right hand side, by the C1 alpha norm of the boundary data, plus this guy, which is the free boundary condition. After all, this is a free boundary problem. So the free boundary condition has to play a role somewhere. Right? <laughs> what is the other condition of the theorem? I can completely disregard 
I can completely disregard the regularity of the boundary data. So boundary data is one alpha. Okay. I can disregard DPT if I ask also that the solution becomes a sub-solution across the free boundary. In other words, I do not care about DPT if I ask that when I cross the, the solution, cross the free boundary in a, in a super solution, in a super solution fashion. And it is not artificial. There are many examples in a similar perturbation theory of free boundary problems where this kind of thing you get for free. So there are many examples in the literature where this happens. Um, okay, so difficulties in the nonlinear setting. The difficulties here are to overcome the use of potential theoretical arguments like harmonic measure, Poisson kernel in Green's function. This theorem, some of these theorems are proven for linear equations with very smooth coefficients, right? But there, the harmonic analysis of the second order LP enters very out of the way. How do you do those here? Uh, yeah, okay, that's it. So uh, the, the original proofs of that is using this potential theoretical argument. But if I were to be nonlinear, there is no potential theory for, for this type of equation. When you see the proofs, you also see the use of some reflection principles. Reflection principles do not get along very well with the viscosity theory for fully nonlinear PDEs. So we have to somehow try to overcome the, the use of reflection principles. And third, to overcome the presence of the unbounded right hand side, uh, which is kind of new here. Uh, for free boundary problems, the passage from the bounded to the unbounded coefficients, I mean, at least to my understanding, in Bernoulli type free boundary problems, I think this is the first result. So what is the novel? What is the novel of work? All the estimates are a consequence of geometry of barriers. So I need to construct barriers for unbounded coefficient equations. And then with the use of these barriers, right? I can replace all the proofs and there are new proofs with, where I cannot use the potential theoretical arguments. So with, with this barriers, we can uh, uh, use the geometry of the barriers to produce new proofs of, of, of these ingredients and eventually the theorem at the end. So here is how the pieces of the proof got together. It took me quite a while to, 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 to discover this diagram and, and, and what thing implies the other. Uh, so essentially everything follows from the geometry of the barriers. So the geometry of the barriers uh, implies a Lindis lemma, which measures the expansion of the level sets from the boundary to the interior. It also controls the solution the, the, by the negative distance function to the free boundary. It allows me to prove the, the trace estimate uh, on tangential points. And here is where uh, the ideas from harmonic analysis appear. This is due to Carlos Kenny uh, in the study of uh, the Say maximal operators for the solutions for the Dirichlet problem uh, when you have uh, some uh, LP boundary data, right? So you have these trace estimates, and then with some con continuation uh, sub solutions lemmas across the free boundary, you can use the, the control by the distance, then regular uh, gradient PD estimates to you the results. Let me try to, I mean, so, so th this is how the, the pieces of the how the pieces of the how the pieces of the proof glue together, and you can say so. The proof is very involved. The geom is a very geometric proof. Mm -hmm. What is the Lindis lemma? The Lindis lemma. I mean, this is a name uh, that, that you can you can find in the literature with many many meanings, right? In the meaning that I'm using here is you have some information on the boundary. You, you, so you have a, a solution or a sub or a super solution, let's say, of a PD with some information on the boundary. So some quote, let's say, solution is bigger than M on the boundary. Then you can prove that this the solution becomes bigger than a multiple of M inside the domain. 
So it's like if the information from the boundary propagates inside the domain. So the proof is very intricate, especially the boundary when you have to relate with this non tangentiality issues about the, the points. So let me try to, to give you an idea, at least in the interior, which the proof is more elementary, why barriers are important and why barriers are fundamental to the proof. So let me talk about the interior Lipschitz regularity, right? Uh, so if you have a free boundary problem, to prove that the solution is Lipschitz, the most crucial step that you have to do is to control the function u. Suppose that you have a solution in your basic free boundary problem in B1. What you have to do is to control the function by the distance to the free boundary. If you can prove that you, you can control your solution u by the distance to the free boundary, this implies Lipschitz regularity. Let me show you how. So let me go back and revisit the basic theory of harmonic functions. Everything follows from there. Suppose that you have a non-negative uh, C1, but you can take C infinity, harmonic C1 up to the boundary, harmonic function, right? And I want to bound the gradient at the origin, let's say, right? Then the gradient estimate says that the gradient is bounded by the L infinity norm of U over R, <laughs> right? This is the, the classical gradient estimate. But since the function is non-negative, the L infinity norm of U in BR over two becomes the soup of U in BR over two. And you can control by the infimum by Harnack. But if you can control by the infimum, you can control by the value of the solution at the origin. So the gradient of the solution in the, in the center of the ball is controlled by U zero over the radius. Suppose now that additionally to this setting, I give you a point on the boundary of this ball where the function vanish, the function is on negative. The function vanishes there and the normal derivative exists there also. Then you have a quantified way of the Hopf lemma. I think this, my impression is this first appears in the work of Beresit, Kaffarel, and Nirenberg uh, in late 80s, I think, 89 or something, right? And so if you have a harmonic function, non negative, the quantitative version of the Hopf lemma said that. Because the Hopf lemma says what? If you have a harmonic function that vanishes on the boundary, the normal derivative hits there with an angle. But the quantitative version quantifies the angle. The angle is u of zero over r, right? In other words, if you glue those two estimates together, the gradient that is controlled by the value of the center at over r, by Hopf, the value of the center over r is bounded by normal derivative. Then what do you get? You get that the the gradient of u, right, is bounded by the normal derivative. I like to see this as saying that the Hopf lemma allows the propagation of the information uh, from the boundary to the interior, because I have, a, I have an information on the boundary, say, let's say, a bound normal derivative far away from the center, but the Hopf lemma allows me to transfer the information from, from the boundary to the interior. Let me convince you realistically that this proves that the, 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 the solutions of free boundary problems are Lipschitz. Suppose that I have the following situation. I have a harmonic function here. Here u is positive, here negative there. Suppose that my function is harmonic here. And suppose that the free boundary is smooth, C1, let's say, and that the normal derivative on the green here, the normal derivative here is bounded. So I have a harmonic function, negative, positive here, negative there, and the bound in the normal derivative is bounded here. I want to prove that the solution is Lipschitz in say half a ball. But that's kind of very clear, right? Uh, this is kind of clear. Why? Because what do we know from here? That the that the gradient at the center of the ball is controlled by the normal derivative. This is what they're saying. If you have a non-negative harmonic function. If I have a non-negative harmonic function, if, if, if the function is C1, if the, the normal derivative exists on the boundary, the gradient of the center of the ball is bounded by the normal derivative. Let me apply here. Take a point on the positivity set and compute the distance to the free boundary and take this ball and apply that lemma to this ball. Then the gradient here 
is bounded by the normal derivative there, but the normal derivative there is bounded because it's a data of the problem, right? The gradient is bounded there. So the gradient is uniformly bounded anywhere you take here. So the solution is Lipschitz then, right? But then, uh, so the point is, I think I invert the order of the slides. The problem is real life sinks in, right? And the free boundary may not be smooth anymore. In order to use the, the, the reasoning, the, the proof that I gave, I assume that the free boundary is C1. But remember that in a free boundary problem, my goal at the end is to prove that the free boundary is regular. So I cannot use that the free boundary is regular at all. Right? So what are the problems? Free boundary may not be smooth. The normal derivative may not exist, right? And the free boundary may not become uh, regular. So what should I do then? I should try to search for an intermediate quantity to do the intermediate point that, that will do the job that the normal derivative will do, but I don't have the normal derivative now. And the, the thing is, this u0 over r, you see? If I have a non-negative harmonic function and a point on the boundary where the solution vanishes, u of zero is bounded by the normal derivative, which in, in general case does not exist, right? But uh, in other words, uh, so u zero over r may be controlled by the normal derivative, and but this quantity also controls the gradient. So the normal derivative controls this guy, the normal derivative controls this guy, and this guy controls the gradient, but the normal derivative may not exist. So I have to find a substitute for the normal derivative eventually. So the u zero over r is the key, is the key quantity here, right? Okay, so what are the idea? Uh, the idea is to formulate the, 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 the problem in the viscosity sense. Whenever you don't have some differenti differentiable ingredient in the problem, you change this for test functions. I don't have it, but anytime that I test, I get whoever is smooth, this guy will, will, will satisfy the property. So I, in order to, to, to overcome with this difficulty, uh, the idea is to formulate the price, the, the, the formulate the problem in the viscosity sense. The price that I have to pay, I have to construct good barriers because otherwise I cannot test the, the definition accordingly. Um, so here is the definition of the viscosity solution. I will not spend too much time on that, but you as a viscosity solution of this problem, right? A harmonic function satisfies this condition on the free boundary. If whenever you have a, touch, a touching function, touching it from below, you transfer the bound of the gradient there to that function, right? So I, ca I cannot talk about the gradient of u because u is continuous. But whenever I touch u from below but I smooth function, I can talk about the gradient. So I impose the estimate on the gradient of the testing function. Uh, let, let, me, let me just mention this. This is a, this is a barrier, it's a very basic barrier. So if I give you a ring, of radius r and r over two is very easy to, you can construct by hand this function. Uh, it's very easy to construct a harmonic function that vanishes on the outer boundary and there is of some height in the inner boundary. Let's see if I have a picture for that. Here is a picture, much better than. So it's very easy. Suppose that this, this, this the, I have a ring of radius one half and one. It's very easy. You can construct by hand a harmonic function which says, the value of the, the, the solution here is some quantity, let's say M, right? And vanishes there. I have a formula for that, but I don't care about the formula. What is important to me is the geometry. The geometry of this value, suppose that this, this, this radius here, R, R and R over two, uh, when, whenever you solve this by hand, you can see that the normal derivative, the inner normal derivative of this function along of the free boundary here, along the outer boundary is proportional to the height over the radius. Basically, it's intuitively, right? If you push a tangent line here, eventually this is smaller than the height over the radius, right? In fact, you can prove much more. You can prove not only the normal derivative on the boundary is proportional to the height over the R, but the whole gradient in the ball is proportional to that. Okay. Doing that, let me convince. I gave a heuristic proof why solutions to free boundary problem of one phase should be Lipschitz if the free boundary is C1. Uh, so now suppose that the free boundary is not C1 and I will take a viscosity solution and I will prove for you 
that the solution is Lipschitz. Let me do it by hand here. So take a point on the free boundary. They take a point in the positivity side, and then you take the ball that touches the free boundary there. Since the function is non negative and the harmonic here, it satisfies Harnack inequality. This means what? This means that all the, all the solution in this tiny ball is comparable to the value of the solution at the center. Meaning that u of x for every x here is bigger than some multiple of x zero. In other words, you construct the cylinder, the solution is on the top. But if the solution is on the top, right? Then you create this lily flower, the, the piece of the fundamental solution, the barrier that I just discussed a minute ago. And then by comparison principle, U is harmonic, right? It is above my barrier, which is also harmonic in, in this sphere. In the second sphere, that's a triviality because U is non negative and my barrier is zero. So U is harmonic in, in this ball, my barrier is harmonic in this ball, and on the boundary of the ring, U is above the is above. The, uh, the area on the boundary. So maximum principle says, right, the solution is above all over. In other words, I touched my solution in blue by a smooth function on the free boundary point. The viscosity theory tells me then what? That the gradient of the solution here is bounded by, the gradient of the solution here is bounded by the free boundary condition. But the gradient of the solution here is proportional to the height of the radius. The height is the value of the solution here, and the, and the radius is the distance to the free boundary. So I just controlled in a universal way a solution by the distance. So here is the formal proof of everything I said. Right? By the end of the day, let me see if I have a, by the end of the day, I control u by the distance to the free boundary. And then since the function is harmonic and classically, everything becomes. Okay, now what happens? So this is for uh, for two phase uh, problems. Let me skip that. Is a I can reduce the two phase problem to one phase problem by this very powerful ingredient called the Alcafarelli monotonistic form. If the problem now, if the function is not only positive, it, it becomes negative eventually. And also, right? I have a way to control the product of the normal derivatives on the free boundary once I. Once I use the argument that I used before by the Alcafarelli monotonistic formula, it is as if the problem becomes one phase. And then I can repeat that. So let me skip that. So this is the Alcafarelli monotonistic formula. So here's the fundamental ingredient that we constructed. I want to substitute the barriers that we constructed by hand a minute ago for the harmonic functions. And we did that using the fully the, the, the put check stimulus operators for fully non -equal. You see, instead of having Laplace equals to zero, we take this fully nonlinear operators, both of them, right? And the same scenario is zero in the let's concentrate on this one, is zero in the outer sphere and some value of the inner sphere. And then we prove that the solution of this problem exists and that satisfies the same geometry that we had before. In other words, the height is proportional to the gradient, which is proportional to the function over the distance, provided what? Provided the right-hand side is much smaller than M. This is the key point. In other words, let's think on that. If F is zero, morally this function, it is like the previous barrier, if F is zero. I mean, the, the fact that there is a fully nonlinear operator is not a big deal if this is zero. So if the function is zero, the barrier is exactly that one that I just wrote, right? But if there is a right-hand side here, yeah, it interferes in the geometry of the barrier. But it said that if the, if the size, if the size of the right-hand side is not too big in comparison with to the height, the geometry is preserved. And here there is another, another interesting point, which is the following. So the, this, this thing here is just to say that the geometry, the geometry of this barrier is exactly the same we did before. In fact, if the right-hand side is very tiny, like this condition here, human eye cannot distinguish between the solution for the Laplace and the solution for that one, because the geometry is the same. I don't care about how do I get to, to 
if I have a formula or not for the solution, what is relevant for me is the, is the geometry. It's the only thing that I use to prove the Lipschitz estimate. But here there is an interesting thing also. Since I have, I have also a bound for the gradient, right? I also have a, the gradient is also comparable to the height. Then my solution becomes also a, a good solution for quasi linear operators like P Laplace, because you know that the P Laplace, the G Laplace, they have a power of the gradient in front. If I lose the control of the gradient, I cannot handle this operator. But, but if the gradient is bounded above and below, which is happening here, the, the gradient here is bounded above and below because the gradient is universally comparable to the height, then I can use these barriers for quasi-linear operators, right? Okay, so here, here, is the, here is the geometry of this barrier if the right-hand side is very small. So if the right-hand side is, the, the, the LQ norm of F is very tight in comparison with the height, the geometry is like this as it was before. And then what happens now? Then I repeat the proof. How do I repeat the proof? So if I am in that old scenario, same old scenario, right? What I do is I apply Harnack inequality. It is as before. No, because I have a right hand side. The right hand side has a contribution into Harnack. But then I use this dichotomy. Right? This dichotomy says if the contribution of the right hand side is much smaller than the height, <laughs> then Harnack work as before. Not only that, the geometry of the barrier also works as before. So under condition one, I can reproduce the proof that I did before word by word. In other words, if the, if the right-hand side is much smaller than the height, the geometry of the barrier does the job as it did before. In the other case, where the, the height of the solution is, is, is not bigger than the right-hand side, is smaller, I get for free because the solution is controlled by the distance. This power here is bigger than one. So I can replace it by one. So the function is controlled by the distance trivially in this case. And in the previous case, I repeat the proof that I did before. And I also get the, the solution. So in the first case, I get that. In the second case, I get that, right? So the crucial point is are the barriers. If I, if I have the barriers, I can reproduce word by word uh, what happens in the interior regularity. For the boundary regularity, that's another story. Uh, for the boundary regularity, I don't have time to, to talk. I, I still have two minutes to finish. I don't have time to talk. The proof is, in fact, the proofs are new because the proofs for the boundary depends on potential theoretical arguments. Right? So we, we need to come up with new proofs, but all of the proofs are consequence of the geometry. And one of the consequences of the barriers is to prove the Hopf lemma, right? So if I have a non-negative solution of a super solution of a fully nonlinear PD like this, <laughs> right? Then I have the Hopf, if, if I have U, which is a solution of those two differential inequalities, I have Hopf, you see? U over R, remember the previous Hopf. The normal derivative was bounded below by u zero over r. Since my my function now is in LQ, I have the, the I have now the, the contribution of the right hand side. This was proven. Uh, I did this with Ederson, but at the, the very same time, Boyan Sirakov had got a completely different proof. And for fully nonlinear case, his theorem is, is stronger than ours. They come up at the same time, uh, but the theorem, the, his theorem is uh, it's stronger. But the, the fact is our proof also works for the, for the G Laplace because our, barrier, our, our, our argument is geometric. Our barriers have control on the gradient. So this, the same proof that we did here by a little adaptation also works for the Hopf lemma for the, the homogeneous case, okay? Uh, so here is where I enter in the discussions of the, the strategy of the proof, which is very delicate and I will skip. Uh, here is the crucial part of the proof where you have some trace estimates. That this is a very nice idea that came from Kenny to control the behavior of the solution on non tangential cones and transfer the regularity inside the cones to the regularity on the boundary. This is what Hopf lemma does. Uh, and here is the Langley's boundary growth lemma. I can show you later, Giovanni, and you'll have time to do it now. But it essentially says the following, if the solution has some height on the boundary, 
right? And there is a super solution of some fully malignant PDE. Uh, if you enter in the domain, the solution may decays a bit, but it is still proportional to that value. That's what I mean, this line tells, which it is known in many contexts, but I think in the context of fully nonlinear PDs uh, with unbounded measurable coefficients, I, I, I don't know any other, uh, I think maybe this, this is new, at least my impression. And here I have the, all the iteration schemes that we have to do uh, and, and the, the final ingredients of the proof. Uh, they are very technical, so thank you very much. Thank you for the very nice talk. Any comments or questions from the audience? You can check online too on the participants. Yes. Somebody has a question, you can raise your hands online. Yeah, I had uh, some questions in the beginning. You showed these nice examples. You can uh, uh, you show these nice examples where you, if you have uh, the data of your PD in LN, the result fails, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems natural to assume in some of these results that your function f, at the right hand side or mm -hmm. part of the equation, is in LQ for Q bigger than n, right? And things work. But you know, I mean, it's there are some spaces in between, right? Sure. In ln and lq, you could take an ln log square, sure. log q. You sure. know, very nice. Do, do people consider these spaces? Some of these examples, can you actually assume less than lq? Can you assume ln log the uh, power of log? Let, let me tell you. Let me tell you what, what is the what is what is not. Uh, yes. Let me tell you. That's a very nice question. Let me give you a kind of answer that. Uh, it is true, we know it is true. Some of, I mean, the whole lemma is not written in that context, but the regularity theory, some of the regularity theory is written. And the point is the following. Let's say that you get Ln, let's say you have a domain or any ball inside the domain, right? Let's say the R of radius R, you, of radius R, you consider you consider the LN norm here, right? What do we know? We know that if, if the LN norm in these balls are universally controlled by a modulus of continuity, which is Gini continuous, the result holds. Uh, then there is a work, a very interesting work of Giuseppe Mingioni which has to be, uh, there are some results of Agni Banerjee also for fully nonlinear, for fully nonlinear equations where they write this Lorentz spaces, where this, this Lorentz space like this, where the distribution function has some integrability conditions. So the Simon alpha regularity theory works for right hand side in this space also. So this is Lihe Wang. Lihe Wang. And I think this so sure is LN, just LNN, no, in the Lorentz space notation. Yes, right. And then you're kind of improving a little bit to LN1. Yes, right. So here is this result is Giuseppe Mingioni and 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 Donner Armin Banerjee. Uh, so this is done for at the level of the so there are some results from the regularity theory that works in this case, or this let's say C1. So, Suppose that I give of, of uh, Laplace of, of u equals to f c1 alpha boundary data and the right hand side there are in, in none of those space solutions has a gradient with some models of continuity all the way up to the boundary. So this is a fact, but this has to be converted into the hop lemma and the barriers, all of them. And this is one, one of the ideas that I have to be working in the, in the next, uh, with some students, we are, we started working on the <coughs> Yeah, yes. right, in between. So in other words, the, some of the regularity theory up to the boundary, the gradient survives, but uh, for, to apply for free boundary problems, you need to use this as a piece of information to prove hope, to construct barriers and to apply to free boundaries. And this is one of the projects that I'm doing with some students in front of this. Very nice question. And, and I, I think at least as, as far as I know, those are the, the sharp, let's say, the, the sharp spaces where you cannot improve. I mean, a 
less people to another type of space. Right? Another type of space, like you can maybe. If you, if you, if you just consider LB spaces, LN is the better. Then, if you enter into the business of Florian space, then you start with LNN and you say that, okay, I can go up all the way up to LN1, but not better. Right, not better. And then you can. And uh, then another, for, for instance, there is a student in Fortaleza just finished his PhD last year, and we, he proved the same theorem for divergence equations. But for divergence equations, we change the right-hand side and we put the right-hand side in the Mori spaces, I see. right? So in the Mori spaces, I think you can go to Mori spaces too. <laughs> and there, I mean, that you have to play a little bit with the exponents to see what is, what is going on. So then I, then I put the IQ of Q bigger than N because I, do, I don't want this. I just want to find the argument at least to, to show that in classical cases, you have the estimate for free value. Now there is the whole business of finding the optimality also the exponent, which is a very, very interesting question. Very interesting question. Very nice, very nice. Any other questions or comments? Oh, no, not, let's thank Diego again. All right. Thank you very much, Diego. We can, like, we can stop the recording. All right, let's see how is it. Yes. Okay.